you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks to all of you for coming. You know, I was at uh, Ed Koch's memorial service a couple of weeks ago, and Bill Clinton walked in carrying a sheaf of papers like this, and he said, I just want to assure you all this is not the eulogy. Uh, these are just the letters that Ed Koch sent me while I was president. Well, I'm happy to say this is not a eulogy either because we still have Grand Central Terminal. Uh, we came very close not to having it, but fortunately it was saved, and we'll talk about that. I'm going to talk uh, a little while and then be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Um, when I began this book uh, and met with uh, my colleagues at Grand Central Publishing, we came up with the title, Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America. And then I went home and I said, did it? I mean, you know, that's a pretty ambitious agenda to have to live up to. And I realized that it easily did that. It, the more I researched the book, the more I realized that uh, this was a transformative place. And just stop and think for a minute. If you go anywhere in the world and say, this place is like Grand Central Station, everybody knows what you're talking about. It's a metaphor for frenzy, for chaos, for busyness and bustle. Uh, people recognize it all over. Grand Central has been the site of ransom demands, mail train robberies, triumphal homecomings, hope-filled send-offs, the target of Nazi saboteurs, terrorist bombs. Its passengers have included presidents, living and dead. Kids left for summer camp from there, and soldiers went to war. Everyone has a favorite Grand Central moment. Ben Cheever, whose father John Cheever chronicled the suburban commuter, said that it's as inviting as a rich person's house with the doors thrown wide open. The concourse is larger than the nave of Notre Dame Cathedral, and yet it's strangely inviting, he wrote. Even as a child on my dismal way to Brooks Brothers to be fitted for a flannel suit that would chafe the skin of my thighs, I did not feel diminished. Brian Selznick discovered Hugo, the book and film character, at Grand Central. And my own best memory of Grand Central is when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, my father would take me to lots of places around the city. And sometime in the 1950s, I was standing on one of the platforms in the train terminal, looking up at this gleaming locomotive, New York Central number 371, I still remember it. And the engineer leaned out of his cab and said, hey, you want to come up and drive this thing? You know, what could be better than this? So he helped me up, put me on his lap, put my hand on the throttle, and the engine chugged forward two or three feet. To me, it seemed like a mile. Uh, I was driving a locomotive in Grand Central Terminal. Well, you know, New Yorkers kind of take things like that for granted, certainly take Grand Central for granted. And I assumed when I started working on this book, I knew everything there was to know about it. But again, I learned so much, and I keep learning. And every time I give a book talk like this, someone comes up to me at the end or in the question period says, did you know that so-and-so? So it is a learning process that goes on and on. And like my day job at the Times, I'm sort of getting paid for getting a postgraduate education. Now, technically, Grand Central is a terminal. But the word terminal conjures up endings, and Grand Central is really a place of beginnings, not the least of which, of course, is its own. It's a terminal because trains terminate there. Railroad people like to recall the apocryphal Rube who asked a conductor whether his New York Central train stopped at New York City, to which the conductor replied, there'd be an awful crash if it didn't. <laughs> well. You couldn't tell that story about Pennsylvania Station. For all its splendor, one person described it as reducing New York to a two-minute stop on the line from Long Island City to Rahway, New Jersey. Now, Terminal also suggests a destination, and in fact, it has been the gateway to New York since 1913 and the city's gateway to the continent. To those of us Joan Didion wrote this. She grew up outside the city. To those of us who came from places where Grand Central Station was a radio program, 
New York was no mere city. It was instead an infinitely romantic notion, the mysterious nexus of love and money and power, the shining and perishable dream itself. Now, I'm not sure how many of you remember, I don't, but every Saturday morning on CBS radio, an announcer would intone, as a bullet seeks its target, shining rails in every part of our great country are aimed at Grand Central Station, heart of the nation's greatest city. Drawn by the magnetic force of the fantastic metropolis, day and night, great trains rush toward the Hudson River, sweep down its eastern bank for 140 miles, flash briefly by the long red row of tenement houses south of 125th Street, dive with a roar into the two and a half mile tunnel which burrows beneath the glitter and swank of Park Avenue, and then Grand Central Station. Crossroads of a million private lives, gigantic stage on which are played a thousand dramas daily. Now just imagine listening to that on the radio in some other part of the country and the image that that would conjure up in your mind. Since then, the terminal has threaded itself into popular culture even more. Mad Men's Roger Sterling gorged himself on oysters and martinis there. Cary Grant called his mother from a phone booth before fleeing town on the 20th Century Limited in North by Northwest. Animals romp in the main concourse in Madagascar. Philippe Petit performed his tightrope walk beneath the celestial ceiling. Now, it's interesting, we again take it for granted, but from a commercial standpoint, Grand Central was one of America's first multi-use buildings. It incorporated shops, restaurants, stores, offices, in short, all the diversity of a city within the confines of one building. I have to admit, I'm not sure I totally believe this story, but Holiday Magazine recalled the exploits of a newly married couple whose train to Niagara Falls was canceled. So they honeymooned at Grand Central. They got a room at the Biltmore, linked to the terminal by an underground corridor. They dined, danced, took advantage of the terminal shops and exhibition halls, and did all this without ever seeing a train. Even more amazingly, they returned a year later to celebrate their wedding anniversary. Grand Central was home to the first CBS television studio. Edward R. Murrow would broadcast uh, What's My Line came from there, the Goldbergs came from there. Unfortunately, sometime later in the 1950s, when television sets got better, people realized that when the screen was shaking, it wasn't their set. It was the vibrations from the trains moving in and out of the terminal. So the CBS studio had to move over to West 57th Street, where it still is today. There were great trains, like the 20th Century Limited. We all know about red carpet treatment. Well, the term, which goes back to ancient times, was popularized on the 20th Century Limited. Every night when that train left for Chicago, porters would roll out a red carpet the full length of the platform, and passengers would go down that carpet on the way to the train. It was like traveling on the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, but just going cross country. An amazing thing and hard to imagine today. Standard Time was born at Grand Central Terminal. There were something like 100 different time zones in the United States until Charles Dowd, who was a uh, boarding school principal at what later became Skidmore College, came up with the idea of establishing four time zones. And Grand Central was the first place where that was begun. Now, one of the things I discovered in the course of my research is that some years later, Charles Dowd was killed in an accident uh, upstate. He was run over by a train, of all things. And uh, unfortunately, history does not tell us whether the train was on time. Grand Central was a consummate civic monument. It was the result of a merger of two architectural firms. Why two? Well, one was Reed and Stem, which to me sounded like a landscape firm, Reed and Stem. Uh, but Alan Stem was the brother-in-law of William Wilgus, who was the chief engineer of the railroad. So they hired them to build um, Grand Central. 
But then Whitney Warren came on the scene, another architect from Warren and